Today, I am delighted to be joined by Simon Yeo, who is Head of Policy and Advocacy at Positive Money. Positive Money are a recent joiner to the DPF community, um, one of our new strategic partners. And given their focus on the potential for money to be used as a tool for improved social and economic, pol economic policy delivery, um, we're really excited to have them as part of the conversation. And I'm really excited about this conversation with Simon today as well. As we'll see soon, Positive Money have done a lot of the very early thinking um, in the potential for CBDCs and new forms of digital money as well. Um, so welcome, Simon. Would you like to introduce us and give us uh, introduce yourself and give us a bit of background? Sure. So yeah, I'm Simon Ewell. I'm head of policy and advocacy at Positive Money. So I've been at Positive Money for over six years now. And Positive Money is an organisation which um, yeah started in the kind of aftermath of the 2008 crisis, um, focusing on on you know how the money and banking system works and how it got us into that mess and how it can be reformed. So originally, a lot of the focus of our work was on you know, the question of where does money come from? Because, you know, in the kind of textbook models, um, the descriptions were, you know, quite inaccurate. They were saying, oh, banks just, you know, take people's savings and lend them out to people. But, you know, as, you know, economists have, have you know, found over the years and it never really made it into the neoclassical textbooks, banks were actually creating money when um, they make um, loans. So when a bank makes a loan, it creates both a new... Um, deposit and an, a new asset um, which it receives in, interest on and we kind of argued and you know people like Adair Turner echoed this um, that you know one of the reasons which we had for, for why we had such a big financial crisis was banks were kind of you know unconstrained in their ability to create new money and that led to them creating it for you know bidding up asset prices and using it irresponsibly to make you know short-term profits but you know, then as we saw, um, because we kind of rely on banks um, to provide the means of payment in the society, we had to bail them out when things went wrong. So yeah, we, we started um, in 2010 and over the years, we've been kind of broadening out from that kind of original focus on like, where does money come from? And, you know, you know how is it created and how is it distributed to looking at, you know, various reforms um, that could improve the way the system works, you know, like um, digital currencies, like um, having better macroeconomic policy, um, and also, you know, uh, better financial regulation more generally. So, yeah, we, we work on a range of different topics these days, um, you know, housing, um, green finance and climate change, as well as um, topics like the digital pound um, and new forms of, of money. Thanks, Simon. And, um, you know, that, that point you raised there earlier, that banks don't take deposits and make loans as many people, um, you know, assume they do. Rather, they create deposits by making loans um, is one that we've discussed and, and touched on, on on many of our previous podcasts um, and is explored in far more depth than the Bank of England's 2014 paper on money creation in the modern economy for those who are interested in exploring the topic more. Um, and I think that it, it's an incredibly important distinction to make um, and one that has such a bearing on, you know, our understanding of public versus private money. Um, and I was really interested to read some of Positive Money's earlier papers on central bank digital currency. So there was a paper on digital cash, which was written in 2016, um, and another one on money we trust in 2020. And these were four and eight years old, respectively. And what's really fascinating is that many of the topics that are covered in them are still very fresh. They're still the topic of discussion and consultation in the Bank of England's recent discussion and consultation papers on the digital pound itself. So can you tell us a little bit about those papers, their origins, what they were about, and what's changed over time as well? Because I know you've mm. mentioned that your thinking on them has, on those topics has evolved over the years as well. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, a, lit, a lot of our early work um, was focused on improving kind of competition in payments. Um, so we originally had proposals to um, allow um, payment providers to have access to um, central bank um, transaction accounts 
um, which would enable them to settle payments. Because, you know, as you and many of your listeners probably know, um, at the moment, you kind of have to rely on the big clearing banks who have um, exclusive access to central bank settlement accounts to, um, you know, make payments. So if, if you want to compete with them and offer better payment services, you have to, you know, go through the hurdles of becoming a, a bank, which, you know, is very costly, um, you know, and you need to be able to comply with lots of capital requirements and things like that. So our proposal was, you know, to to have, you know, a kind of, you know, um, narrow banking, as the term it often is, is used, um, mm -hmm. approach where, you know, people could, uh, payment firms could have access to central bank money um, and, you know, um, be able to offer payment services without needing to, you know, um, comply with um, prudential regulation in the same way. So, but, you know, it, then, you know, there became a kind of, I guess, development amongst central bankers talking about, you know, whether you could just have retail accounts at central bank. And this, you know, is an idea that goes back a quite a long time. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, it was discussed in, in the 90s, at least, you know, with the advent of kind of electronic um, money. Um, and yeah, it's the idea of allowing um, citizens to have access to accounts at the central bank. Um, so yeah, we published this paper in 2016, though it was like a kind of an idea that we'd been talking about in terms of an early proposal for a sovereign money system to have um, transaction accounts at the central bank, um, you know, um, where people can make payments without needing a bank account. Um, but essentially, yeah, it's it's the kind of the core principle of, you know, allowing people access to um, risk-free money at the central bank, which would enable um, the settlement of payments, um, you know, without needing to essentially lend their income to a bank and expose themselves indirectly to credit risk. So, yeah, as, as, as you probably know, unless you're paid in cash, um, you have to essentially lend your income to a bank. And, yeah, that gives banks huge amounts of power. Um, there's an uncompetitive market for deposits. And, yeah, it you know, banks we've seen are kind of don't use that privilege very well. So, yeah, the kind of question that we we were looking at was how do you kind of level the playing field and kind of democratize access to central bank money, which the public have in physical form in cash, but in a digital version. So the 2016 paper, you know, I think was one of the first kind of civil society interventions in the debate around CBDC, as we now call it. Um, and yeah, it was making a positive case for how a central bank digital currency could Im improve stability um, and offer better kind of payment services to the public and, and better macroeconomic outcomes. And we followed that paper up in 2020 with a paper on called our Money We Trust, basically, you know, making the argument that kind of central bankers have increasingly had to refer to that kind of trust in money, um, in the kind of private forms of money that we use, like bank deposits, is anchored um, by the provision of public money. So I guess like one way you can kind of describe it is that there's separate layers of the, the money system where we have um, public forms of money, which are the ultimate foundation. And on top of that, um, private banks build up their, you know, and issue their private forms of money. And we kind of trust that these private forms of money are worth the same as these, you know, foundational public risk-free money because we're able to um, quite easily um, convert them between each other but you know if we if we lose cash uh, which I don't think we should I think we should keep cash for as long as people want to use it um, but if cash becomes harder to access um, it becomes harder to convert um, those forms of money and uh, particularly with other forms of digital money like you know privately issued stable coins you also need a kind of public anchor um, which can you know be the, the, the key kind of foundation between all these other forms of money. So essentially, yeah, we, we our argument is that, um, you know, money is a public good. The public should have access to risk-free um, money issued by the government and shouldn't have to rely on, you know, a small handful of banks, um, you know, to hold their money who ultimately um, entangle um, the provision of payment services with um, credit risk. So, yeah, that's kind of our um, ultimate take on why we need public money. 
but you know we've kind of recognized so in, in our original reports the 2016 report on digital cash which went on to inform the kind of platform model that the bank of england has where the bank of england you know operates a core ledger and then payment interface companies um you know operate services based on that ledger is an account-based system and we kind of repeated that assumption in our 2020 paper as well um in which we actually argued it, it could be a case for an account-based system to bear interest um you know so that you could have a better control over monetary policy um while we still think an account-based system might be important particularly for large transactions um we've kind of come to see increasingly that there is a strong case for a non-account based form of cbdc which you know the bank of england hasn't really been looking at to its full extent at the moment but would it essentially involve a bearer instrument uh, model kind of like cash rather than um payments and possession being authenticated by an account and identity linked to that account um it would be validated by possession of a token so like, like in the same way you know the cash in your in your in your uh, wallet you know physically you, you it's it, it doesn't have any information that connects you to the to the instrument but you know it's just the fact that you possess it is is given enough that you know you can use it so yeah um we've been exploring different models for this and you know there's been interesting proposals like the eCash act in um, the united states um which um some congress peoples have been um putting forward you know a kind of bearer instrument a version precisely because it's such a, a politically toxic issue um around a central bank digital currency where people are worried that having accounts at the central bank might um impede upon their privacy and might mean that they are subject to to surveillance from um you know um the state and other actors so i think it's really important um to to offer a kind of offline version which isn't connected to any kind of account and can function like a true digital form of cash as a bearer instrument for people to trust and use it um because i think in the uk we're seeing essentially yeah like people's biggest concern and what you know what, what they want to say when they have a consultation on cbc is they're worried about privacy so i think the the best way to do that the bank of england can make all these guarantees and the government can make all these guarantees but the 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 best way to do it is to make it in the technology itself um not relying on accounts um and you know being able to have a cash like instrument which you know what people benefit from today um and yeah i think there are also other benefits to having a token based system in terms of you know greater um uh, usability um in in you know situations where you can't access um a network which you know many parts of the uk uh included in that and yeah allowing more efficient and cheaper transactions if you can settle peer to peer um which is what you know the original um goal of um bitcoin was to allow a, a peer to peer payment system but it's it's it since turned into something else but yeah i think peer to peer payments are a kind of holy grail of payments which haven't managed to be properly cracked yet but i think a digital pound offers an opportunity to do that um you know especially if if it is using um kind of cryptography and um you know token based um systems um to to implement there's a lot to unpack there simon yeah. um and i think you know probably working in reverse order one of the very important topics that you raised was obviously you know one of the key functions of a digital pound would be a um a form of public money that was that continued to be accessible by the general public in an era era of declining cash usage but if that public money is to take a digital form then digital inclusion is something that we need to consider mm, well definitely. digital inclusion is incredibly complex we live in a um a jurisdiction that doesn't consider the internet to be a public infrastructure mm. some jurisdictions do like i think germany and south korea are examples of two that do consider internet access to be public infrastructure and treat mm. it as such um 
but unless if, if if we're basically introducing a form of money that we expect to be accessible by the general public then digital inclusion becomes a significant issue as it does um in any case already through you know greater delivery of public benefits and things like government benefits through um you know the the online government portal and things like that um and digital inclusion is not just about who has a mobile phone it's about whether that mobile phone can be connected to the internet has yeah. reception at any point in time and this is not just about you know people living in rural areas i mean i live in bermondsey in you know se1 500 meters from tower bridge and mm. if i walk 10 meters outside my block of flats i don't have mobile reception yeah so yeah it's um you know, I, I think that that whole argument around digital inclusion is, is an incredibly important national mm. conversation that we need to have. And indeed, one of the challenges that we have in the introduction of a digital pound is that it's not part of a wider digital economy strategy or anything mm. like that, which is why I, I guess, you know, if, you, if we look at the digital euro, it has many challenges, but it has progressed to a far more advanced stage of planning. Um, than the digital pound has in the UK, partly because it is tied into a um, an, an EU-wide strategy around digital finance, transition to a digital economy. It's accompanied by plans for digital identity and things like that as well. Mm, yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, your point about, you know, the internet being a public infrastructure, I think we should also recognise the money tree system as a public infrastructure, right? You know, that I think... As I say, money is such an important public good. If if we lose access to the ability to make payments, um, you know, society basically ceases to function, and that's essentially why we had to bail out the banks because we realised, um, you know, if banks started failing, people wouldn't be able to make payments anymore in the digital economy. So yeah, I think it's it's super important we have a really robust system which doesn't require an internet connection, especially in an inc increasingly uncertain future where. You know, we have potential cyber attacks, you know, energy insecurity and, you know, climate change and things like that. I think we really need to uh, build the most robust system possible, which would be resilient to all those threats. And I think the best way of doing that is an offline capable system, which would have to be token based to be truly offline. And, yeah, I've, you know, I've, I have the exact same experience myself, even living in London, you know, the, the amount of times I've, you know, not being able to pay for something because they're card only and then there's a network problem. You know, when, when festivals have tried to, you know, trial contact, so cashless, you know, um, experiences, you know, that it's always seems to be the case that something goes wrong and then you can't buy a drink at a festival, which is, you know, a big, a big um, disadvantage for, for both the, the business and the consumer. So, yeah, I think, you know, the, the current systems we have, you know, need to be thought about more holistically. And I think, yeah, you're right, like a kind of proper strategy on this is going to be crucial because I think, yeah, as, as you suggest, you can't really disentangle um, financial inclusion from digital inclusion. And I think, yeah, we, we need to kind of deliver a final product to the public, which is as simple and intuitive as possible. And I, I like to think, you know, it should in theory be possible for someone, you know, without needing any ID or anything to access, you know, a kind of device, like whether it's like a, a small a smart card or something, which has a, you know, a small amount of digital pound on it, which they can use to make transactions. Mm. Um, you know, this raises obviously a lot of questions about you know, economic crime, KYC, AML, etc. But I think we do actually have um, solutions for that, or at least opportunities to do those things in a, in a better way. And I think you know, one thing that hasn't really been unpacked as much in its potential is, you know, the um, potential for a kind of new way of doing things like AML and KYC, um, particularly AML, and, and, and tax enforcement is by having, you know, kind of one-sided privacy where um, you're only looking at the kind of uh, payee's income um, to, to do enforcement. You know, you don't need to see what, what people are spending their money on but you, you need to kind of see where they're getting their money from mm -hmm. and i think that would now enable um you know people to to pay for things with a digital pound um, without worrying that you know their data is going to be surveilled or analyzed by someone but retailers would still have to comply with being able to show 
you know, that all of their the money they receive, you know, where where that comes from. So I think there's real opportunities there to reduce the huge costs of compliance with AML, things like that that you know aren't really being explored. I think we need to take a more imaginative approach to it and think about all these issues together, as you suggest, with a strategy where you know mm-hmm. we are looking not only at the opportunity for a better payment system, you know, but also better ways of doing all kinds of things um, mm. with, that new technology can enable. And um, I think you'll be, now that we're partners as well, you'll be joining um, the DPF's Privacy and Identity Working Group, which is doing a lot of work on the future of AML and looking at topics like that. Mm. Um, but you've touched on something else there as well, which is, um, you know, when you talk about AML, it's it's very much wrapped up in in the challenge of financial inclusion. The fact that when when someone is onboarded to a bank or a financial institution, they have to go through a very standardized AML process, and this involves you know producing um, some form of photographic nationally recognized ID, so a driver's license or a passport. This involves um, also producing proof of address in the form of three bills, or, you know, things like that, council tax bills. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a highly standardized process and one that also makes a lot of assumptions implicitly about the life of the person who is going through mm-hmm. the opening process. And, um, you know, to, to a great extent, our entire financial system in the UK um, relies on some very outdated assumptions about what the behaviour of the population is, that you're going to, you know, leave school somewhere between the ages of 16 and 19, that you're going to um, open a bank account, that you're going to get a national insurance number at that point, that mm. you're, um, you know, at some point in later life, you're going to buy a house together with someone else while you are in full-time permanent employment. Um, and and even for many people who are born in the UK, many of these assumptions don't hold true anymore. Yeah. We're seeing the rise of the gig economy, we're seeing a more mobile workforce, we're seeing people in more insecure living conditions, particularly in a cost of living crisis. Um, and that's before you look at, you know, migrant populations, at immigrants who, you know, the UK wants to attract, at refugees, um, the recent influx of Ukrainian refugees, for example. Um, you know, these are all people who are excluded at some point in the financial system from access to banking, to payment services, and, you know, in the longer run, potentially to credits as well. Um, and so I've often, you know, said that when asked whether a CBDC is really going to deliver financial inclusion, you, a CBDC on its own doesn't deliver financial inclusion. Mm. It's not a financial inclusion is not a technological challenge. It's a yeah. policy challenge. We have to overhaul the way we think about AML and KYC and the lives of the people who are involved. Yeah. I think what you've been saying as well. Yeah. And this is something that's come up, you know, in the roundtables we've had with the Treasury, where, you know, we've tried to bring in civil society voices who represent, you know, the marginalised and people, you know, who don't, who aren't served by the, um, you know, current financial system. Um, and the kind of, the, the people being concerned by the way the Treasury has talked about um, the digital pounds, you know, that financial inclusion isn't a priority for it. That's kind of an afterthought. You know, the, the, obviously the main objectives of a digital pound are um, stability of the monetary system, but also innovation and payments. Um, but financial inclusion is a kind of nice to have, you know, thing tacked on to the end. So we've tried to be, be encouraging, um, you know, the government and the Bank of England to think of this as a, 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 a technology which could, or, or a new way of doing things which could enable um, greater financial inclusion. Because I think at the moment, the, the approach has just been to, to leave it to the usual actors to to deal with financial inclusion, i.e. the banks or, or you know, um, other credit providers. And we've seen, Which you know, that hasn't helped. worked. Yes. Yeah, like we, yeah, they, they haven't. And they, they have no incentive, really, because at the end of the day, for a lot of these kind of people we're talking about who are on low incomes, you know, they're not um, attractive customers. You know, Christine Lagarde, I think, said it like, banks aren't exactly rushing out to, to meet these customers. And why would they? You know, it is actually quite expensive for a bank to 
to provide services and they had to be subsidized elsewhere in the business. So like the basic bank account was a great, I think, um, win for financial inclusion. But yeah, ultimately that is quite an, an expensive way of giving people access to, to payments in, you know, in the modern economy. And yeah, I, I'm hoping with, you know, a kind of digital pound, we could have a better alternative to that and to enable people to access money um, in a digital economy without needing to go through those mm. same requirements and hurdles, which, as you say, like expect people to live a, a pretty uniform life. And yeah, I, I think we should be embracing opportunity to support, you know, a diversity of of, of people and lifestyles and communities um, being able to, you know, live in, and work in the ways that they want. And I think that's ultimately, you know, what, what hopefully a, a digital pound and monetary innovation can help us with, I'd hope. And so what are some of the other social and economic benefits that positive money sees uh, as potentially being delivered by a well-designed digital mm. PDC? So, so a key one for me, which is rarely talked about, um, but I think I've talked about it to you before, is uh, the seniorage um, revenue from digital pounds. So, um, you know, the, the Bank of England used to make quite significant profits from um, banknotes you know, several billions of pounds a year. This is because when they essentially sell banknotes to a bank, um, they take the money and invest them into government bonds, and then the profits from those government bonds are remitted to the treasury. So essentially the government was benefiting from several billions of pounds a year from note issuance. Obviously, if the decline of cash, um, that kind of seniorage revenue, which you know, is the, the profits from making money, um, have been transferred to banks and a digital pound actually enables the government to kind of recapture some of that benefits from from the issuing of public money um, that have been lost. Um, so in the case of a digital pound, the Bank of England will be issuing new money, um, new liabilities, but it will be backing those assets, those are liabilities with um, assets like government bonds and um, essentially the profits from those assets um, will be recycled back to the Treasury. A new Economics Foundation did a study back in 2017, which suggested this would be, um, I think, around eight or nine billion pounds a year. I've done more recent kind of estimates, and because of um, a greater increase in deposits, but also higher interest rates, this could be in the region of 20 to 30 billion pounds a year um, kind of cost savings. Um, from having a digital pound. So it's quite a difficult concept to get your head around, Stevie Rich. Um, but yeah, essentially it's the the kind of profits from being able to issue money. Um, and it could be potentially, you know, transformative for a government. You know, politicians are saying we 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 can't afford 20 to 30 billion pounds a year of, of green investment, which is deemed necessary to save the planet. But I think governments with the adoption of a digital pound are going to be given a huge windfall from essentially lower lower borrowing costs mm -hmm. um, from you know um, their um, payments on bonds being recycled um, back to them via digital pound. Um, and I think there's only a question about what can be done with that. And I think one way to to spend that money is to invest it in a kind of national development bank, you know, uh, which can. Um, either invest in projects directly to support a greener, fairer economy, um, lend to councils, which obviously we, we know need the money, um, particularly to invest, um, or just simply on lend um, the money to um, other banks, particularly kind of stakeholder banks, um, which banks which serve communities, um, like mutual banks as well, um, which um, offer better models of banking. And yeah, I think therefore a digital pound in this way by recycling the kind of profits from public money back to the public through these institutions could enable a greener and more prosperous economy. And I think, you know, a lot of concern around a digital pound is focused on disintermediation, you know, um, banks losing their deposit funding as a kind of bad thing, right? Because then um, this could mean um, then providing less credit to the economy. But we've kind of flipped it on its head and said, actually, this could be an opportunity because banks currently are pretty poor at allocating credit. They um, don't lend it to the real economy. They chase whatever, you know, offers the greatest return on equity to their shareholders, which is usually mortgages, 
which are kind of a zero sum game economically. Um, you know, in the long run, there is no real benefit and, and can lead to huge amounts of inequality and potential financial instability. Um, so yeah, actually this could give us more of an opportunity to make sure the, the power to create money, which is I guess what power, positive money was focused on, kind of focusing on, um, was founded on focusing on, um, how we can make that more democratic and um, bring that into you know the, the public realm to decide what we want to do with, the, with these profits and yeah, how they can support the real economy. So I think there's really, really an opportunity for a bolder vision and, and people have done this for the US, like Solo Morova, who was um, Biden, President Biden's original pick for Office of Control of the Currency, people like Robert Hockett as well, um, have worked on basically putting forward a kind of blueprint for how, if we did move to a kind of digital fiat currency, like a central bank digital currency, how this would actually be an opportunity to um, improve the financial system, not only in terms of financial inclusion, but also in terms of ensuring a product a flow of capital to productive um development so yeah i'd be keen to to try and explore and replicate that thinking in the uk um because yeah i think it's really exciting and when people you know ask them so how's the digital pound going to benefit me if, if you're not like kind of financial excluded and you know you don't see the kind of costs of the current system as a consumer maybe this is one way to convince them you know we could have a a better economy um, because we would be able to help shape the allocation of credit to you know where it's needed. That's super interesting because I think a lot of the you know the the public debates and and the argument about the benefits of CBDC um, aside from privacy, which is an you know an ongoing topic, and let's not go in there too deeply because I think it's already discussed widely elsewhere. Um, but for a lot of the public discussion focuses on the use case. So what is the point of, you know, a CBDC? What will we use it for and things like that? And I mean, for me personally, when we think about CBDC, the reasons to think about CBDC are far wider than just how can it replace, you know, payments use cases today. It's more about the geopolitical context. It's more about, um, you know, the um, the potential for uh, as a platform for innovation. It's more about, you know, global positioning and things like that. And I think you, what I'm really excited to be working with Positive Money on, on is looking at these, you know, other potential ways in which the introduction of CBDC, new forms of digital money more generally, um, can help. Um, can, can can help to change the allocation of priorities in the financial system so that they better they lead to better social and economic outcomes, which is I think what you're you know you're you're very much interested in as well. Um, and more broadly, you know, positive money is not about it's just about digital money. It's about how money in general can be used as a tool and mm. deployed for better social and environmental outcomes. Um, how about we finish off with you telling us a bit more about your your broader work um, and also, you know, some of the other topic areas that you're looking at that are priorities at the moment? Sure. Yeah. So I think, as I mentioned, we broadened out um, our work quite significantly from our original focus on, you know, how banks create money and how, and how that issue can be reformed at its heart. Um, so we've we've gone on to look at, you know, what are the other kind of impacts our, our money and banking system has and the way in which banks allocate, allocate credit are causing social and even environmental harm. So we've done a lot of work on, on green finance. Um, we were kind of pioneering some of the work, I'd say, around um, greening central banking, which has become a, a big topic at the time. Uh, sorry, big topic recently. Um, so we've been doing work around how the Bank of England's monetary and financial um, policies are essentially reinforcing um, the climate crisis and banks, um, you know, kind of preference for lending to fossil fuels rather than renewables. Um, so, yeah, we, we've looked at ways in which you could use Bank of England tools in a way which could actually support a greener economy. Um, we've also looked at housing in recent years. Um, so, you know, obviously, as we talk about the way in which um, banks predominantly lend to mortgages, that means that you, you have a, a huge amount of new credit um, 
bidding up prices of a finite supply of houses. And, you know, we've talked, we've looked at how the transformation of housing into an asset um, via the banking system has, you know, uh, led to poor outcomes for everyone, even even homeowners themselves who, you know, even if their their house um, appreciates in value, they, you know, it isn't really much of a benefit to them if they still need to live somewhere. So the only people who really benefit from the system are people who own multiple um, properties. So yeah, that's um, another area and a kind of a bigger area as well, I would say is, is more about the kind of macro economic coordination and so this has become, I guess, increasingly relevant with the way we're, you know, responding to issues like inflation by um, using interest rates, raising um, the price of money um, in a way which is quite inefficient and doesn't actually deal with the causes of inflation. So we, we kind of have a perverse system where we're, we're trying to deal with inflation by raising um, the cost of living for you know a small handful of of mortgage holders and hoping that will you know it kind of immiserating them will um you know cool demand in the economy and cause inflation to go lower but when you know the kind of research we've done um, emphasizes that inflation is in, in particularly driven by supply side factors like um you know supply chain disruption and um you know climate change causing um unstable um kind of harvest and those associated issues and you know we think there needs to be a better kind of strategy to deal with the kind of macroeconomic um consequences of, of these issues um involving not only the bank of england and interest rates but also um where democratically elected governments can um, be more active in um, fiscal policy as well not just leading it to the Bank of England, because as we saw in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, the, the focus on the Bank of England and QE, uh, quantitative easing, to stimulate the economy as well, also just you know, didn't really do much for the real economy, but increased inequality and kind of set us up for the kind of financial instability we're seeing, what we've seen in re more recent years, when suddenly you have to raise interest rates um, where after having them low for a very long time and then you know that suddenly causing the you know, um i guess a house of cards that have been built up from qe and low interest rates to suddenly collapse so yeah we, we think there are you know potentially better ways in which you can deal with um the economic problems of today than the traditional um tools used by the, the bank of england Thanks, Simon. It's been absolutely fascinating having you on today. I'm sure we could have spoken for much longer. And, you know, the, the, the last few topics that you raised, I'm sure that each of them is worth a deep dive themselves. Uh, but very much looking forward to working with you and exploring more some of these topics in more depth um, through this through our partnership between Positive Money and the Digital Pound Foundation. Great. Thank Coming you. Coming on today.